Right. Good evening. Welcome. I'd like to uh, call to order the virtual study session of the Lakewood City Council in Lakewood, Colorado on February 6th, 2023 at 7 p.m. If you are unmuted and typing, maybe we could get you to mute real quick. All right. Um, so those that wish to participate tonight, the dial-in number is 720-707-2699. The webinar ID is going to be the same for that dial-in as well as for Zoom, which is 820-6281-3086. Mr. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Paul. Here. Abel. Here. Franks. Here. Jansen. Here. Maya Guerrero. Is she on the line? I do not see her in either. Vincent. Here. Strom. Here. Charizai. Here. Springsteen. I don't see her. Stewart. Here. Over. Here. Mayor Paul, you have a quorum. Awesome. Well, I'd again like to welcome everybody and thank you for uh, tuning in. I think there's a lot of interest tonight. We have actually three presentations and um, we're going to go ahead in the first two. I think are, uh, one was brought forth and sent to the LAC, so we're excited to have them join us. And the third presentation is an update on the beginning stages of our housing study. So, Mr. Clerk, will you please take it over with item three? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Molinar from the LAC Sustainability Subcommittee. Uh, Ms. Molinar is here with us tonight to present on the LAC's assignment related to water conservation and House Bill 22-1151. And I am going to share my slides and Great. be advancing on behalf of Elizabeth and then uh, Jeff from staff. Good evening, Ms. Molinar. Nice to have you with us tonight. And I'll also mention that these are on uh, lakewoodspeaks.org. So I'll just turn it over. Good evening, Mayor Paul and city councilors. Thank you for having the opportunity to present on behalf of the Lakewood Advisory Commission on this increasingly important topic of water conservation. The document that you have received from us uh, the Lakewood Advisory Commission has a lot more details, but tonight I'd like to highlight some of um, the parts of uh, the suggested plan that we brought forth. Um, all right, why, why is this important? Next slide, please. Water conservation has been an active priority for many citizens in Lakewood, especially with increased drought and reduced water supply in the Mountain West region. House Bill 22-1151, Turf Replacement Program, was signed into Colorado state law in June 2022 and directs the Colorado Water Conservation Board to develop a statewide turf replacement program, which will provide one-time funding to incentivize the voluntary replacement of non-functional irrigated turf. The program will begin July 1st, 2023, and local governments are eligible to apply for grant funding to support existing turf replacement programs, although the process is still being developed by the Colorado Water uh, Conservation Board. The grants uh, require a dollar for dollar match by the local government. Alternatively, if a local jurisdiction does not have an existing turf replacement program, homeowners will be able to apply for funding through third party contractors uh, selected by the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Next slide, please. At the May 23, uh, th 23rd, excuse me, 2022 City Council meeting in Lakewood, the City Council assigned the following task related to water conservation to the Lakewood Advisory Commission, the LAC, um, and uh, has been worked on by the Sustainability Subcommittee of the Lakewood Advisory Commission with the intent that the Lakewood Advisory Commission report back to City Council with recommendations. And uh, we received 
four assignments. The first one you'll see on the slide as well. How do we leverage the state turf replacement funding? The second one was, what are other municipalities doing to help residents reduce outdoor water usage? The third one we worked on, how can covenant controlled communities reduce their outdoor water usage? And the last one, are there any municipal codes adjustment that need to be made to support water wise landscaping? <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in order to fulfill um, uh, these assignments, we um, used the following process. We surveyed what other cities and municipalities are doing in Colorado. And sometimes this uh, made us go down the rabbit hole and look at all sorts of other states and what they were doing. Uh, we also reviewed literature on water conservation. We checked, uh, checked HOA rules and researched how to work with HOAs. We reviewed current code. We consulted with the staff of the sustainability division. And um, once we had uh, a draft, we discussed this with the Lakewood Advisory Commission Sustainability Subcommittee. And then later, the process is that it goes to Lakewood Advisory Commission as a whole for approval. Next slide, please. So now as up for these assignments, the first assignment, um, because city staff within the sustainability division was already working on addressing residential water conservation, uh, the LAC worked collaboratively with the staff to respond to city council's assignments and make recommendations. The LAC, after extensive consultation with the sustainability division staff, recommends that a turf replacement program leveraging state funding be a part of a larger, more comprehensive residential outdoor water efficiency program. The LAC and staff collaboratively worked to research best practices, identify key partners, assess resource needs and availability, and then develop options for moving forward that aligned council's assignment with the sustainability plan's goals. The first step of the program would be to implement a low-cost two-year project focused on creating incentivized water conservation strategies and education. The results and impacts of the project will be used to inform long-term program structure, including partner organizations, resources, and funding requirements. And the staff recently submitted a Colorado Water Conservation Board grant requesting $100,000 to support a two-year residential outdoor water efficiency project that would begin in spring of 2023 and is estimated to save 2 million gallons of water. An award decision is expected in March of this year, 2023. Having a contract in place with an organization like, for instance, Resource Central, uh, in spring 2023 would position the city to quickly leverage state's funds as soon as the turf replacement program is established. Additional potential funding mechanisms include funding from the state turf replacement program, state and federal water conservation grants, the city's general fund, low interest financing, or a combination thereof. Because water conservation is a pressing issue that will be a focus for many years to come, this proposed project should be the first implementation step of a longer term uh, community water conservation plan. Results from the residential outdoor water efficiency project will help the city prioritize which conservation measures will be most impactful to residential water savings and should be included in long term planning. Next slide, please. All right, moving right along to assignment number two. Several front range communities have established education and incentive programs targeting outdoor water conservation. Several Jefferson County municipalities, including Wheat Ridge, Golden, and Arvada, use organizations like Resource Central, a nonprofit based out of Boulder specializing in wa water conservation implementation, to administer their conservation programs. It must be noted that other front range cities have found permanent water restrictions more effective for reducing water use when compared to voluntary water restrictions. However, um, in our um, uh, recommendations, we're focusing on um, voluntary reductions only. Next slide, please. 
Homeowner associations have the responsibility of maintaining common area landscaping, thus having an important role in outdoor water usage. Many common areas are covered in non-functional, aesthetic only, turf, and are inefficiently irrigated. HOA laws in the state prohibit associations from adopting covenants that ban or restrict xeriscaping or require owners to use turf grass. HOAs can, however, enforce the appearance of their communities, staying dead on irrigated grass as enforceable, while active xeric garden would not. Um, despite these laws, there is still misinformation about landscaping requirements within covenant controlled communities. The LAC recommends that an HOA toolkit be developed specifically to teach covenant controlled communities how to reduce outdoor water use. The toolkit would provide an action list and resources, including clarification on state law surrounding turf requirements, alternative to turf grass, efficient sprinkler head technologies, irrigation assessments, and optimizing watering schedules and communication templates. The appendix in, uh, appendix C, sorry, in uh, the recommended or suggested plan includes a list of items that could be included in such an HOA toolkit. Upon completion, the HOA toolkit could be distributed throughout the city, primarily through communication with HOA communities and members, property managers, and may be useful for commercial properties also. Communication with the residents of HOAs may also be important, maybe via postcards or such, to empower the homeowner in an HOA to be able to add water saving ideas to their landscape. Additionally, the HOA toolkit can help facilitate fact-based discussions among homeowners and their HOAs regarding specific water conservation projects. Next slide, please. And then our last assignment, assignment number four. Lakewood's uh, current municipal code does not have specific language regarding the use of waterwise landscaping, aside from a reference to xeriscape gardens being exempt from height limitations as a site nuisance. Actually, there was uh, somebody who came to the Lakewood Advisory Commission meeting to talk about like the grasses in his front yard. So we um, had some input from community members too. Additionally, it is unclear how the role of native grasses for residential landscapes integrates with the, the city's definition of what constitutes an unlawful condition on property. Several other communities have comprehensive landscaping ordinances that encourage the use of low water native plants and grasses and restrict the use of non-native grasses. Lakewood has an opportunity to incorporate code language that will reduce outdoor water use while maintaining a vibrant Colorado native landscape in our neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So we came up with a couple of re uh, recommendations that um, you see on your on the slide here. <clears throat> the, uh, the LAC in summary has four recommendations. The first is to develop a residential outdoor water efficiency project, the first step of a long-term ongoing community water conservation program, and develop a resource plan for project implementation. Second, establish a partnership with an organization like Resource Central to create a residential outdoor water efficiency project. <clears throat> the third is, use research and information from the LAC to develop an HOA toolkit focused on water conservation. And then the fourth, review the municipal code and develop proposed revisions that will help reduce outdoor water use and align with the city's adopted water conservation goals while taking into consideration neighborhood values and the importance of code enforcement responsibilities related to noxious weeds, fire hazard, and aesthetics. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And um, we also uh, try to think a little bit about equity and equity as uh, entangled with sustainability. And we suggest applying an equity lens when executing this turf replacement program. For Lakewood to achieve the most favorable results from these water conservation ideas above, it is important that we find ways to engage all our citizens, households, and communities. Uh, a few uh, things to include or, or to think about 
when um, developing the plan is that we may wish to incorporate financial means in our designs. Uh, Lakewood must navigate communication barriers and multilingual outreach to best increase our successful implementation of these ideas. Um, multilingual outreach is not only verbal, but also needs to be written word translators to allow English as a second language users the ability to, for instance, read the bids and contracts and licensing documents. And lastly, we should recognize that age and disability will require more human power to accomplish water conservation, and some form of volunteer assistance may be essential as well. Okay, next slide, please. And um, this concludes my uh, part of the presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And I will now turn it over to Jeff Wong of the Sustainability Division. Thank you, Commissioner Mulaner. Thank you very much. Well done. Mayor Paul, we should have Jeff Wong, our senior sustainability planner on the call. Sure. And he's he's here to present the staff's response to uh, the LAC and, and Jeff provided a lot of hours uh, to this project. Oh, okay, yeah, we're, we're moving him to, to be a presenter. So out of curiosity, is this essentially number four then? So we're doing three and four together? Correct, unless okay. there are, yeah. Nope, that's fine. Mr. Wong, good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Uh, good evening and good evening to the city council and members of the public. Uh, my name is Jeff Wong and I'm a senior sustainability planner in our sustainability division here. And I'll be taking a few minutes to talk about how we'll be implementing some of those recommendations that LACs just presented to you, as well as highlighting some of the existing conservation work that the city's already doing. Um, I also do want to give a brief update on the status of the state's turf replacement program. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to take a brief moment to reiterate some of LAC's recommendations that you just heard. So they're recommending that staff develop a residential outdoor water efficiency project that includes both an incentive program um, that would be administered by a partner organization, as well as an education and community outreach component, um, which would help inform residents on how they can save outdoor water without sacrificing any aesthetics. Um, the LAC is also recommending that staff researches potential changes to our municipal code to promote water-wise landscaping. Um, last year, knowing that the state, state turf replacement program was coming and that council gave this assignment to LAC, we decided to prioritize uh, water conservation planning, uh, knowing that's a, that it's an, an important topic to you as well as uh, residents in Lakewood. So we've been able to use a lot of um, the LAC's research to develop the framework for a conservation project. Next slide, please. First, I want to take a step back and remind you that reducing citywide water use is a major target of the city's adopted sustainability plan. Our target is to reduce citywide water use by 20% by 2025 compared to our 2010 baseline. The past few years, we've used a combination of education and a regulatory approach for new development to reduce water use. In 2021, our city water, citywide water use was down 4% compared to the baseline. So we still have quite a bit of work to do uh, to reach our target. Uh, we wanna supplement our existing work with additional strategies that will help us to reduce water use. Next slide, please. Um, I just mentioned some of the existing education and regulatory work that we've been doing related to water efficiency. Um, our online water resource center has information about rebate opportunities and conservation tips right now. Uh, the city's also demonstrated its leadership in conservation with the Article 13 Sustainable Development Standards that Council adopted last year, which provide water savings opportunities for new development. Um, our building code updates incorporate higher indoor water efficiency standards for new construction. Um, our own parks department uses a centralized irrigation system to optimize water 
um, water use and reduce leaks. And several of our own facilities have already been updated to reduce indoor water use from sinks and toilets. So these are just some of the tools that we've used to help with water conservation, but we still see lots of opportunity to help our residents save water, uh, particularly with outdoor water use in the, in the existing built environment. Uh, we think that an incentive-based conservation project is an appropriate next step. Next slide, please. So why are we focusing on residential outdoor water in particular? Um, here's a couple graphics from Denver Water. The left side shows water use by category, and you can see that single-family homes account for almost half of all water use, um, and multifamily homes use 20%. So that means residential water use accounts for two-thirds of total water use. Uh, the graphic on the right breaks down residential water use specifically, and you can see that on the right side, 50% of household water is typically used for outdoor irrigation. Next slide, please. So what we're looking to do is to create a holistic project that's completely voluntary, um, that reduces outdoor water use and has widespread participation. We wanna encourage residents and communities to make positive changes to their existing irrigation and landscaping practices by providing a suite of water conservation ob uh, options, which the LAC has already researched and recommended. So staff was already working on this, as Elizabeth mentioned. Um, so it was nice to use some of their research to add some details to our framework. Um, to fund these incentives, as Elizabeth mentioned again, uh, we applied for a state grant last year for $100,000, and we expect to hear about that in March. And I do want to clarify this grant in particular that we already applied for is different than the state's turf replacement uh, grant program, which just opened up, and I'll talk about that in a minute. As a reminder, the incentives we're proposing include discounted xeriscaping kits, um, a discounted turf removal and replacement option, no cost irrigation assessments with an option to include smart technology. Uh, we recognize that different households in Lakewood have different priorities with their landscaping and lawns. So our hope is that we can create a variety of different strategies that meet residents where they are. So for example, some households, they don't wanna replace their turf. Um, so it might be more appropriate to get an irrigation assessment um, and a smart controller so they can uh, optimize their watering schedules. Um, other households might want to focus on changing out their flower beds with more native plants to encourage pollinators. So that's just a couple of, of examples and, and all of this would be voluntary. Um, another benefit of this project is that having an existing turf removal program will put us in a strong position to leverage that, the matching funds that will be coming um, from the state's turf replacement program. Uh, to ensure equitable access for the project, we plan on offer, offering additional discounts for the Garden and Box program from income, for income qualified households. And we want to make sure to include targeted bilingual outreach about the program in our lower in income neighborhoods. Um, the other aspect of this project is that we want to create a more widespread water conservation campaign that's focused, focused on educating single family households as well as HOA communities. Things like recommended plant lists, design templates, uh, watering schedules. We think that type of information would really be helpful for households. And then for HOAs in particular, we know many communities have been asking us how they can cut down on water use. Um, so we want to create a toolkit that contains information and ideas for irrigation optimization, uh, turf alternatives for common areas, um, all without sacrificing aesthetics and, and the characters of their community. And this would be geared towards both property managers and residents. And again, we want to make sure our education information is inclusive to everyone in Lakewood. So that might mean uh, bilingual literature in English and Spanish. And uh, we also want to include tips for renters on how to speak to their own property owners or managers about outdoor water use. Next slide, please. Um, what are the outcomes and takeaways that we're hoping to achieve from this project? Uh, we're estimating about 2 million gallons of water of savings each year from this project. But we do want to refine the savings that are associated with all the different strategies that I just met, uh, mentioned so that we can really understand the impact of um, the different efficiency measures that we're offering. Uh, we also want to gain insights from our community engagement and education campaign to 
identify any gaps that we have and see how we could increase participation in the future. Um, ultimately, we'd like to take the lessons learned from this project and create a long-term water conservation program that encourages and, and excites residents to conserve water. This would require additional expenses, um, so staff will continue to explore additional funding opportunities where it's appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so since the time that the staff memo was submitted to council, we've received new information about the state turf replacement program. So I wanted to give you an update on the legislation. Um, last year, the state legislature passed the house bill that requires the Colorado Conservation Board, Water Conservation Board to establish an incentive program for the voluntary removal and replacement of non-essential turf with water-wise landscaping. The state won't be administering their own program, but instead is offering funding for our eligible entities to administer their own turf replacement programs. And that includes local governments. Uh, the first of two funding cycles just opened up um, last week and closes at the end of March. Uh, the second funding cycle will be later this fall. Uh, the state expects that each award won't exceed $25,000 and it may even be less depending on the demand for this program. Um, applicants are required to contribute a dollar for dollar match. So staff is currently evaluating our existing resources uh, for this opportunity. And any award that the city receives from this grant in particular will be used to increase the number of incentives that we're offering for residents from the other grant opportunity that I mentioned on um, the past couple slides. And then one correction uh, for from Elizabeth's presentation, the state has pivoted a little bit and is now not offering a third party program. Um, so any entities or local governments that don't have their own um, turf replacement program of their, they won't be able to send those residents to a state-sponsored program or state-managed program to get those turf replacement dollars. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to the voluntary programs and incentives, regulatory tools are another way we can tackle water conservation. So knowing that it's important to, to all of you, staff will work across various departments to review our existing municipal code um, in its language to ensure that our own policies don't really create additional barriers, but instead they encourage water-wise and native landscaping. And again, we wanna balance water conservation, aesthetics and property maintenance. Next slide. Um, just a few takeaways to wrap things up here. Um, if our grant is awarded this March, we'll be creating a holistic water conservation program focused on residential outdoor water use. The project would last until the end of next year, the end of the growing season next year, and include incentives to implement conservation strategies, as well as an inclusive education and outreach campaign. We'll continue to identify funding needs and look for funding opportunities to set the stage for a longer term water conservation program. And finally, we'll be forming an internal working group amongst various city departments to review our existing municipal code language surrounding water conservation. Um, that's it. Thanks for your time today. And thank you again to the LAC for their hard work and time in addressing this council request. Great. Nicely done. Certainly appreciate uh, all the hard work um, that has gone into this quick question, and I'm not sure exactly who to direct this towards. If we don't receive the grant, is there an opportunity to have that come back to council for discussion of uh, uh, other ways to fund it? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so if we don't receive the grant, I think we'll regroup internally and kind of reevaluate what sort of resources are available and um, potential options to finance the project maybe. Um, but again, we'll have to regroup. We are cautiously optimistic about the grant, but um, you know, we never know what's gonna happen. Um, I will say that regardless of whether we receive that grant, we do want to have that education campaign for both single family homes and HOA communities. Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Sharzai? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> that was one of my questions uh, regarding the CWCB grant. I, as I understand, the first round of funding this year is going to be extremely competitive. So I wanted to make sure uh, if we had a plan B and were we considering reapplying in for the July second round of funding they're offering. Okay, 
So I see you shaking your head, Mr. Wong. So thank you for that. A couple of other um, just thoughts and questions. I really appreciate the proactiveness. I know that this has been a lot of research, but getting ready to be able to leverage some of the state dollars that we can expect coming out. Uh, it sounds like one of the funding pools is already opened and we can expect a second one in the fall. But I, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is resource central. Do Have we started those conversations with them? I'm just curious about their capacity as this starts to roll out. They're one of the few entities that are ready to get going quickly. And like, you know, I having experience working in the nonprofit sector, like sometimes that's hard when this comes fast. So wondering if we started that conversation. Um, and then we'll ask that and then I'll let others go. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Councillor Sherzai. Um, we have spoken with Resource Central several times. Um, they are uh, they're aware that we submitted the grant. So um, we've been working together to make sure that they do have the capacity. Um, we've been in conversations with them um, in the past six months, I'd say, uh, several times. Great. And just one more question. The 2 million gallons, I think I saw in the presentation you did online, um, savings a year. Uh, we're far from our goal. So is that help us get closer to the um, aspirations we have for 2025 reductions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the 2 million gallons is very small compared to where we need to be. Um, and it won't make a significant difference for our goals at this point, but we're kind of viewing this um, as a long-term project or a step towards a long-term project that ultimately um, hopefully will change the landscape of water use in in um, in Lakewood here. Great. Thank you. All right, Ms. Vincent, then I have Mr. Abel and Ms. Strom. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation too. Um, I had submitted a question earlier today, so I don't know if you have the answer to it or not. Um, <clears throat> but one of our goals is also to increase our tree canopy. So I did not know how this was related to that. I didn't see anything about planting trees in the water, outside water conservation. So my question is, is was this looked at? And it was my understanding that planting trees helps, helps reduce that because it removes turf. Uh, thanks for that question, Councillor Vincent. Um, this project in particular is separate from the uh, tree canopy project, so they're independent of each other. But that being said, um, the incentives that we are offering as part of the, we hope to offer if we get this grant as part of the residential um, outdoor water project would um, address water use and irrigation for trees. So we hope that you know, as the city progresses with tree planting, we can kind of pair that with these free irrigation assessments that residents can sign up for so that they can really learn how to water them properly and not over water. Okay, thank you. Mr. Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and it was a very good presentation, well thought out. Um, but it sounds like we're talking about conservation of water that comes out of the tap. There are other sources of water that are well used in Lakewood and often used in Lakewood, well water, sump pump discharge, and rainwater that we can collect uh, off the roof into a single barrel every year. Uh, also, we need to keep in mind uh, our farm to table needs. Uh, some livestock is still grazed on pasture in Lakewood. And of course the trees, not just the shade trees and other trees, but fruit trees are very popular in Lakewood. Uh, I really appreciate the voluntary nature of this considering well water, sump pump water, or sump pump discharge and rainwater that ordinarily would go back downstream uh, and or to the groundwater and, and water table and then uh, float on down to supply our reservoirs and such. Uh, using those sources of water does deflect some, um, 
in fact, a lot of water from our uh, uh, supplies that then are used to uh, feed the water taps. So I'd like for us to keep all the keep those things in mind while we're putting this together. I also want to say that I think the city needs to uh, buy into this a little more. $25,000 is not going to go very far, especially if you're talking replacing things or uh, helping with the purchase of such things as buffalo grass seed, which is really expensive, and uh, other other uh, xeric uh, plants So, and native plants. So I think the city should consider... Uh, boosting the ante a little bit or a lot in order to help folks cope with the changes that will be required, uh, not, not required by law, but required to meet the $2 million uh, or 2 million gallon a year target. Thank you. Oh, and, and those other sources of water, will they be included in that 2 million a year target? Or are we only talking about tap water and that equation. Thank you. Thanks for that insight, Commissioner Abel. Um, in terms of that 2 million, it's regardless of whether it's a well user or um, someone from the tap connected to our municipal system here. And how do we measure? Oops. Sorry. You're you're muted, Mr. Abel. You're muted. There we go. So, how do we measure the well water that we save, I and mean, and what base do we judge it against uh, in current use and and sump pump water as well? How do you measure how much of that's going out on the yard instead of soaking back into the ground and being transported? Uh, downstream to our reservoir supplies? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that we will work with our partners, um, whether that's Resource Central or um, a different organization to help us um, do those types of measurements. And um, they have expertise in, in working with um, various types of households and communities. All right, Ms. Strom. Thank you. Very exciting information. Thank you, everybody, for all of the work that you've done. I know down here in the Ward 5, and I think I can even um, speak for many of our neighbors in Ward 4, as we're hearing more and more, please, uh, about um, the Bear Creek Lake Park water feasibility study. The conversation of water conservation has also been a big part of that topic. So thank you all for what you put into this. My question is this one point of clarification. There's been a couple of mentions about matching funds, and I wanted to make sure I was understanding that clearly, that we're talking about the city matching state dollars. We're not yet talking about whether property owners' dollars are being matched by this program. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't clarify that. Um, you're, you are correct um, that um, when I was talking about the match, it would be city funds. Um, we do have a, a structure that we're proposing um, that would require some of the incentive programs um, for residents to also put some money into that, depending on the type okay. of incentive. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Mr. Olver. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to bring this conversation down to a little bit of reality. Um, we all got um, uh, an, our Excel bills recently, and it was super high, and we all were shocked. And basically, we call it sticker shock. And I bet every one of us turned our thermostats down a degree or two. Uh, and the same thing is going to happen with water. There is happening. It has happened for years now. We can talk about programs all we want, but it's economics that's going to drive how much water we save. Uh, and, and I learned all this 
when when I was out campaigning and walking around because there was an awful lot of lawns that were dead. And and I knew, and I actually asked a few people, it was like, okay, how come you're not watering your lawn? And the answer always is, it costs too much. And so as we see our water prices go up, just like the heating prices, the amount that uh, that people save is is going to be automatic. Um, so I don't know that we need a giant government program for this. We do need certain little things. Um, uh, I'm all for education of uh, of our citizens, showing them how to change their lawns over um, to zero scaping. What kind of um, plants they can use, what those plants will look like. Um, we've taught, I know one of the slides mentioned the gardens at Kendrick and O'Kane. Uh, I think we could definitely spend some more money on those kind of things. My idea has been, and this is just my own little idea, um, like think of Kipling, uh, Kip, the middle median on Kipling, south of 6th Avenue, all grass, uh, or south of Alameda actually. And, uh, you know, we could actually plant that with a take it out of sod or turf and plant it with certain um, a specific um, zero scaping, low water using plant for a ways and then just put up a sign. And so as people drive by, they can see that plant, what it looks like year round. And we could actually have a, a sign there that says how much water it uses. And then people will understand or be able to go and just take a simple drive and learn what their lawn would look like if they changed it. And so I, I like the whole idea of an education, um, especially since I tried to put in buffalo grass a couple of years ago, gee, probably even five, 10 years ago. It didn't live. I must have done something wrong. And so I could, I could definitely use some more education on what's going to live around here, especially up on Green Mountain where I live. Um, yeah, that, that 25,000 isn't an awful lot. Um, but I would point out, like for instance, on the turf re, uh, replacement or and that economics drives who replaces it, it's going to invert who we need to, to actually incentivize. Um, if we go into our higher income neighborhoods, they all have grass right now. Those When I was walking around during the campaign, it wasn't the people in the long, higher income bracket who were letting their lawns go. It was in the lower income areas. And so if we really want to save water, we got to incentivize the people in the higher income bracket, which you know is pretty much upside down for what everybody generally thinks. So let's see, that's about, oh, I would say also if we want to um, get better, more efficient sprinkler heads, those kind of things. Uh, we need to be talking to Lowe's and Home Depot because what people put in their lawns is basically what they carry. And if they don't carry something, then, well, as you know, if you want to, if your sprinkler head breaks and you want to go replace it, you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or maybe one of the other hardware stores and buy the cheapest one. Um, or something like that. Uh, not necessarily the one that says it's going to use the least amount of water, unless you're thinking ahead again. So that's all I have right now. I, my point is it's all going to be economics and it's kind of going to be driving itself. As water prices go up, people are going to use less and less water. And I think water prices are going to go up. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Maya Guerrero. Yeah, I will say that I think I'm, um, you know, I'm generally in favor of this program. I also really appreciate the the having these two agenda items together and in particular thinking about how setting these things up now might be a foundation for the future. So in that spirit, I also really wanted to point out numbers wise, both in terms of monetary investment, which I believe a couple of others have mentioned, maybe needing additional investment from the city, wanting to ensure that we're really maximizing the investment from the state. Um, but that also uh, 2 million gallons kind of sounds like a lot, but much like budgets for 100,000 people, 
water budget for 100,000 people, 2 million gallons actually is a relatively small amount of water to save. Uh, I think the average American family is somewhere around 100,000, uses somewhere around 100,000 gallons a year. Um, and so I hope that, again, like, I like most of the things that are in this. I hope that this is the beginning of much more aspirational goal setting for the city and um, more amounts of both monetary investment, but also innovation in terms of how to incentivize and uh, create a culture of sustainability here. Cool. All right, Commissioner Mulan, your hand is up. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to uh, mention something in response to uh, Councillor Oliver. Um, speaking of lawns that are unwatered and um, maybe uh, dying, uh, there's also um, a lot, there are a lot of people who are interested in actually taking out the lawns that they have, but they don't really know how to. So for instance, uh, I'm in the steering committee of Sustainable Iber, which is a part of the Sustainable Neighborhood Networks. And uh, we received quite a few requests with information on like how to take a lawn out and do something else, but people don't really know how to. Um, so that would be one of the ways to educate people, you know, like how to take out their lawns and, and put something else in instead of just having it um, die and you know, be there in its sad state. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Oliver? Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about with education. Um, I I think my water bill's too high right now, and I'm just taking my lawn out, and unfortunately, I have some pine trees, so it nothing grows. Um, but like I said about the buffalo grass, obviously, I did it wrong, and so um, tools to learn how to do it right, what kind of pH the soil is going to need, some other things that I don't know about. Yeah, I'm all for that, that the education part of it. Yes. Thanks. Okay. I do not see any more hands. And so we'll go to public input before I just want to, again, thank the LAC uh, for all your work on this. And I, I do hope this is a, a beginning of a larger conversation. We've seen other communities get really aggressive with with new builds and really limiting the lawn, thinking of Aurora and, and even Castle Rock now, and also looking into gray water systems. So I, I hope that this will lead to further things and we'll have a great success with this kind of almost like a pilot program, which will move us into more sustained outcomes. So Mr. Wong, thank you very much as well and your team. And so this is the point where the public comment piece of this, if you would like to speak, please feel free to raise your hand star nine to speak you'll have three minutes and i don't have my little bell to ding if you're at 30 seconds but i'll make some noise anybody wish to speak on items three and four okay we'll close that piece and uh move into another important and exciting topic and that is uh our item five which is the presentation on the update on the strategic housing plan and um miss hodson i is is miss dietnicker going to present that is that accurate tonight all right so if we can bring miss dietnicker over who is our housing and neighborhood support supervisor and we have a couple of our consultants as well so good evening and welcome Might be having a connection problem. Take your time.
Hi everyone. I'm yeah. I seem to be having some difficulties here. Um, oh, something spinning. I might be getting through. Well, we can certainly hear you. Um, if it's easier just to take your camera off for connections, that's okay too. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. And then um, we have our, the other two panelists also coming through and having issues as well. It looks like we have Andrew and Aaron. Andrew, we have camera on Andrew and Aaron is with us, but I don't know if I have a camera up. Oh, there's Aaron. We have a camera there. Good evening. Welcome. Okay. Um, strange. I don't see him, but um, I will. So tonight, um, I, uh, along with uh, Andrew uh, Rashford from Gruen Gruen and Associates, will be providing a um, a brief presentation for you. Um, I think Aaron will. Or I'm sorry. I think Andy Andrew will be. The, the presentation sharing his screen yep we got that it's on there okay strange i'm just not seeing anything um okay <laughs> then i am gonna get started um hello everybody thank you for your patience um amy deeknicker comprehensive planning and research uh division here and as i said i'm here with uh andy ratchford uh with gruen gruen and associates which is the consulting firm uh, that's assisting staff with the development of Lakewood's first uh, strategic housing plan. Uh, slide two, please. So tonight we're gonna provide just a brief overview of the strategic housing plan process. Uh, we're here to kick off the community engagement efforts, including a community survey that's designed to better understand uh, residents' own housing needs and experiences here in Lakewood. And then uh, Andy is going to present some of the information we've learned so far, which is mostly the current uh, housing and economic conditions um, and housing needs forecast. Please note that this uh, portion and this information that we're presenting tonight is simply what we've gathered so far. Um, so this does not include any um, strategies or tools or recommendations at this time. Um, and of course, we are here to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Although this plan will be specific to Lakewood, it is a piece of a broader statewide initiative to increase affordable housing in Colorado. Through House Bill 21-1271, the state established funding through the Department of Local Affairs or DOLA uh, for communities to identify and implement local strategies that will lead to more affordable housing in Lakewood or in Colorado or both. Um, <laughs> Lakewood applied to DOLA and was awarded funding to hire consultants to assist staff in developing strategies and tools to increase affordable housing options in Lakewood. These strategies will be based on current and projected housing and economic data, subject matter expert interviews and community input. Um, and then the, the goal is that this strategic housing plan can then be used to guide and create policy that helps to increase affordable housing opportunities and decrease some of the barriers that will be identified through this research. Next slide. Here we have a timeline of the expected planning process. We've been working hard to conduct most of the background research and get a clear understanding of the current conditions here in Lakewood. Interviews with uh, subject matter experts um, special pop and special populations are underway right now. Um, this month marks our kickoff to the community engagement efforts. We've launched an informational project website at lakewoodtogether.org. Uh, did we lose Amy? I think we lost you. Mm. Uh, may, maybe we can uh, carry on uh, for her because uh, I think she was almost done. But if she comes back, she can interject. Thank so, you. 
Uh, so I think the next thing we'll do is, uh, th this is Aaron Gruen, but Annie Ratchford uh, will run us through uh, uh, some of the highlights of uh, a very long uh, reports on existing conditions. Yeah, so the primary pur purpose of the existing conditions analysis was to uh, evaluate the housing market quantify housing needs, uh, understand the factors contributing to those needs, and also to inform a strategic approach to improving housing in Lakewood. There's two other key elements of the analysis or the assessment, um, one of which is to make a forecast or prediction of housing needed in the future, and also to evaluate the economics of producing housing in Lakewood. Lakewood is not immune from the reality that inadequate or unaffordable housing supply can become a constraint to beneficial economic development. Attracting and retaining an adequately sized labor force requires also a diverse and a competitively priced housing stock. Insufficient workforce housing uh, also can have quality of life implications, such as longer commutes or overcrowding which ultimately become uh, competitive disadvantages in economic development. There's also other linkages between housing and economic development. So if workers are forced to spend more of their incomes on housing, uh, all else being equal, that means they're spending less on other goods and services in the local economy. That reduction in demand for goods and services can also mean fewer amenities such as restaurants or services, um, will be supportable in the community over time. Housing and construction itself also directly and indirectly generates jobs and incomes uh, for a variety of skill sets. So the first working report that was linked to the meeting agenda um, covers the current housing inventory of Lakewood, current contemporary for sale and rental housing market conditions, as well as an analysis of the affordability of housing or the lack of affordability in some cases. Um, the report also addresses the demographic household income characteristics of Lakewood's current residents and some characteristics related to the economic base and the labor force that bear on housing needs. The second report um, furnished to staff that reviews future growth in Lakewood and makes an estimate of additional housing likely to be needed over the next 10 years. Um, we'll cover a few of the highlights of this analysis uh, towards the end of the presentation. About 18% of all housing in Lakewood is estimated to have been built um, prior to 1960. This older housing stock is mostly comprised of single family homes that are in central and northern neighborhoods of Lakewood. Another 40% of the existing housing stock was built during the 60s and 1970s, which was an especially strong area for single family development in Lakewood. A lot of this housing is in the Carmody, Kendrick Lake, Foothills and Green Mountain neighborhoods. An additional quarter of the housing inventory was built during the 1980s and the 1990s. An additional 18% of the citywide housing stock is estimated to have been built since about 2000. So with the exception of um, Rooney Valley or the Grand Ranch neighborhoods, a lot of this housing inventory since 2000 has been attached single family in townhomes or duplexes or multifamily housing units. An average of 540 new housing units were permitted annually in Lakewood uh, since 2002. Most new development activity has been for multifamily housing, which is comprised of about two thirds or 67% of all new building permits issued over the last 20 years. Another 20% of the permits have been for detached single family homes. From 2013 through 2020, um, annual new permits generally range from about 500 
up to 1,200 units annually. Fewer than 400 units were permitted in 2021, and a similar amount were permitted through the first nine months of 2022, which is when this chart and the data was assembled. The average single family home price in Lakewood was about $722,000 um, through the first 11 months of last year. That average price has increased by approximately 96% since 2015, but a typical single family home in Lakewood sold for around $370,000. The average price for a townhome or a condominium unit was about $403,000 last year and the average price has more than doubled since 2015 when a typical townhome or condo unit sold for less than two hundred thousand dollars the average residential prices in lakewood um, on a per square foot basis have been about four hundred dollars per square foot of living area um, all but one neighborhood in the city has experienced an average price increase of at least 50% over the last five years. There were six neighborhoods that increased by more than 65%. And four of, the, four of these neighborhoods were located in um, Northern or Central Lakewood, which tend to include smaller and older housing units. So to make a generalization, uh, North Lakewood neighborhoods tend to have the highest sales prices per square foot, while South Lakewood neighborhoods tend to have relatively lower prices per square foot. The rental housing market in Lakewood is characterized by low vacancy rates and a high rate of rent growth or rent escalation. So when the supply of any good is low, um, including apartments, prices usually rise in response to demand. A rapid price increase or escalation is a signal to produce more of something. So in this example, produce more apartment units. The overall vacancy rate was about 2.8% in Lakewood North and about 4% in Lakewood South as of 2022. The vacancy rate for apartments has continued to decline over the last five years. This is another indication that new apartment developments are serving unmet demand or unmet housing needs rather than um, siphoning renters from existing units in Lakewood. The average monthly rent in Lakewood North is estimated to have grown by about $400 per unit or 33% over the last five years. This equates to a 6% annual rent growth um, in Lakewood North. Lakewood South has seen similar change in apartment rents um, increasing by about 27% over the last five years, which is about a 4.9% annual rent growth. Newer apartment units in Lakewood tend to command uh, significant premiums over older units. Because the cost of developing new apartments are much higher than they were in the past, the obtainable rents you need to feasibly build apartments and operate them has to be higher. So most rental housing inventory that is affordable to a lower or moderate income household tends to be affordable in Lakewood uh, by virtue of its age, quality, or its location, not necessarily because there's a deed restriction on the property. This is the result of the competition from new apartment supply, which causes older products, or older properties, to not charge as much rent so they can keep the units leased and occupied. The price differential between these newer and older units uh, can be quite substantial. So the chart we've got up on the screen here is depicting the average monthly rent by age of property for both Lakewood North <clears throat> and Lakewood South, with Alameda being the, the demising line between North and South. So units built in the last 20 or so years in Lakewood North are estimated to rent for an average of 2,200 monthly, which compares to average rents of about 1,300 monthly among units that are built 
prior to 1980. This is a price difference of almost 70%. The Lakewood South market area has a similar um, pattern, although a smaller inventory of newer units with respect to um, age and monthly cost. Housing affordability conditions for homeowners have remained relatively stable over the longer term. The cost burden rate for owner occupied households in Lakewood increased by only one percentage point from about 21% to 22% in 2021. And that's over a 21 year period. Over the same time frame, the cost burden rate for renters in Lakewood increased from 39% in 2000 to above 58% of renters in 2021. So the increase in cost burden renters um, primarily relates to both the long-term rent increases, some of which we just reviewed, as well as a stagnation in household incomes. Lakewood, like a lot of other communities, not just in Colorado, but across the, across the country, um, experiences a large deficit of rental units specifically that are uh, affordable at very low prices. A gap or a deficit of about 6,300 rental units is estimated to exist in Lakewood for the lowest income bracket. This also helps explain why such a high proportion of Lakewood renters, which is more than 58%, are estimated to be rent burdened. Almost one half of all renters can afford no more than 1,250 bucks in monthly rent, while the units available at these prices are increasingly scarce to say the least. A large share of the housing needs for both lower income and higher income renters um, tends to be satisfied in the middle of the market which is why a large surplus of rental units priced between $1,250 and $2,500 a month is estimated to exist in Lakewood in relation to the income and social characteristics of renters. A large surplus of owner-occupied housing is estimated to exist at the higher price points of the housing ladder. About three quarters, 75% of all ownership housing in Lakewood, or almost 32,000 housing units, is estimated to have a value that exceeds $380,000. Meanwhile, Lakewood contains about 22,000 existing homeowners who could afford a price of $380,000 above. So the difference between these two numbers, the supply and the need, suggests that there's a large surplus of about 9,300 uh, ownership housing units that are priced above this $380,000 metric. This indicates that there's a lot of existing homeowners who could be challenged to purchase different housing in the community uh, absent a decline in prices. For the ownership housing inventory, the gaps or the deficits, if you will, are really pronounced or concentrated in the lowest price segments of the for sale housing ladder. There's a gap estimated of about 9,000 units for owner occupants um, priced below $275,000. Regions or communities that have high ratios of jobs to available housing units are a lot of times those communities or regions that experience the highest increases in housing costs over time. So the estimated jobs to housing unit ratio in Lakewood today is somewhere around 1.1 jobs per housing unit. And historically, looking back at the housing stock and the number of um, the estimate of employment in Lakewood, this ratio is probably fluctuated between one and 1.2 jobs for every available housing unit. Uh, so the, the jobs to housing balance locally is not unusually high, um, which is an indication that there's other factors aside from job growth that have contributed to the rapid uh, 
housing price increases, as well as the low availability, availability rates uh, for housing in Lakewood. Historically, over the last 20 or so years, the city of Lakewood has, has represented roughly 30% of Jefferson County. When you look at the number of households in the population, if Lakewood is to maintain its rel uh, relative position within the county, keep that 30% steady, then Lakewood would grow by about 5,500 households over the next 10 years. Households with members in the workforce are expected to represent about three quarters of the future growth, while the other quarter, 25% of household growth, is forecast to be um, comprised of households without members in the workforce. So either people who are retired or unable to work and so forth. Of the additional households expected over the next 10 years, again, about three quarters of them are likely to be smaller size households with just one or two household members. Households with uh, three or more people represent the remaining quarter of future household growth. Um, accordingly, in the future, it wouldn't be surprising to see the average household size in Lakewood continue to decline. So if we have 5,500 additional households over 10 years, you need to provide for an adequate mobility in the housing market. So there needs to be some vacancy to allow people to move up or trade down and so forth. So if we apply a 5% vacancy factor to these additional households, it means um, over 10 years, you're likely, uh, there's a need for approximately 58 housing, 5,800 housing units. Um, additional workforce housing need over the next 10 years is most of this uh, housing debate or need, which is estimated at approximately 4,200 units. Um, about two thirds of the workforce housing need for roughly 2,800 units is forecast to be for households with incomes um, that are at or above 80% of area median income. About 15% of the future workforce housing need is estimated to be for households earning between 50 and 80% of area median income. And there's an additional 20% of workforce housing need or roughly 800 units over the next 10 years that is likely to be associated with households that have incomes below 50% of area immediate income. Um, skipping to the right side of this pie chart, we're talking about non-workforce housing need, primarily housing for elderly folks. This need is esti estimated at about 1,600 units over 10 years. About 35% of the non-workforce housing need or 550 units will be for households that have incomes either at or above the 80% of area median income threshold. Another 30% or so of the future need is likely to be for lower or very low income households who have incomes between 30 and 80% of AMI. Um, the largest projected source of non-workforce or senior housing need over the next 10 years is estimated to be for households uh, with incomes below 30% of the area median income. But I would note that uh, a lot of these very low or extremely low income households do already own housing, either in Lakewood or elsewhere. So their annual income uh, might not be a primary determinant of their housing affordability in the future. That was our, our canned uh, highlights the analysis completed so far, so we're happy to field questions and have a discussion. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Much appreciated. And I, and I think you're probably getting a lot of data as this is something many communities are are dealing with and looking at. And I think our peers in Wheat Ridge and Golden have gone through this process. Uh, the numbers of 96% and 109% is just, it's incredible that things have changed that much. And I'll also say your your slide on affordability, ownership affordability on the um, kind of 
a lower end is not surprising as I think we've all struggled to figure out how do we get starter projects or, you know, affordable for sale projects for people to move in. Okay, so let's go to council questions, Mr. Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have questions about 13 pages in this report, but I'm assuming that we're going to be able to discuss these things at a later date in a broader conversation. Do I have a nod on that, Mayor? Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure of of the timeline. I, I this is the kickoff. I imagine we will have many more conversations. And I would also say, if you have 13 pages, we could get those submitted, and they could probably start getting those questions answered. <laughs> yeah, this, this is Aaron Gruen. Uh, uh, just to quickly interject, uh, we appreciate your diligence in reading. Uh, uh, material that's not going to be a best-selling movie. There's no romance or, or mystery to it. Uh, but uh, as I understand it, we're going to have an open house in April, uh, and we're going to have uh, uh, presentations of recommended strategies and updates on other reports later. So there will be uh, uh, ample opportunities to uh, to meet and chat. And if you do have that many, I do like the idea of you're maybe making a list that we can take a look at them and happy to give you a call if that's allowed to go over them uh, or respond if in, in writing in case it helps others. But we appreciate all your uh, your diligence. That might be a record for uh, for a level of reading from an initial report. Okay, I appreciate that. I will submit some questions, but they need to be answered in a public forum because this is an open meeting and these questions are about an open meeting document. Uh, so I'll, I'll hit the points of what I would like to see added. For instance, how many, quote, natural occurring affordable home, uh, affordable housing units have been, uh, or, or new, or have been targeted for future demolition or have been demolished uh, since the housing study of 2017. Uh, on page 17, having to do with jobs and housing ratios, you compare us to uh, Arvada, Westminster, Wheat Ridge, and Golden, as well as some further outlying cities, but you don't include Jeffco. And Jeffco has a lot of influence on what's happening in Lakewood. So the jobs and housing ratio, I think, should include Jeffco. Uh, and I'm not, mm, not so that uh, Broomfield has a lot of uh, direct comparison to Lakewood. Uh, uh, and on page, again, I'll make these uh, quick. On page seven, uh, we mentioned that uh, attached houses and uh, uh, single family housing uh, and or single family residential and uh, attached residential uh, are historically, or we compare the prices and say that they're uh, the, the Attached homes are much less in price. That's been historical, though. I remember in the housing crash of, what, 1990, uh, when I bought my home here, condos and um, townhomes were taking huge hits in price. And that, that price differential was there. So I'd like to kind of see how that is has shaped up historically. How do they compare in seven, 2017 with the last housing study and how do they compare today? Uh, let's see, I want to get to the most. Uh, the, uh, I think that will do for the moment. Uh, I will submit about 10 more questions uh, for eventual discussion. 
but uh, these are the ones I'd like to see better, more complete data on. I think y'all have done a heck of a job. I can't imagine the <laughs> counting all of those beans. Uh, it's, it is uh, a, a lot of information. So if uh, you could maybe see to that, uh, to those few questions, I will submit some more in writing through uh, Ms. Dicknicker, I suppose. So, Mr. Abel, it might be helpful if you submit, if you're able to just submit all of them. I'm not sure exact, just to make sure they know exactly what you want. Sure. I'll, and, I'll come back on yeah. the others as well. And and we can put that through the Lakewood together where this is on, where people are asking all the questions and make sure every, everything's in one place for everybody to see all the information and answers. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, also, there was a public comment about uh, the number of permits issued. If that could be addressed, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Olver. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, have, I have a big picture question, really, as big as it gets, the biggest. Um, how long can we keep building houses or housing? Uh, and in other words, what's what's going to stop us from building more? I mean, when you think, and, and this is for Andrew or Aaron, I, I don't know, whichever one, um, when you think about it and you look around, you know, we're all single family homes, you know, um, in a hundred years, we could have torn them all down and put in two story apartments. And a hundred years after that, maybe we could tear all them down and put in four story apartments and go on and go on and go on. But there's got to be a limiting factor. Uh, I think it's water. Um, would you agree with that? Or or is it something else? Like, uh, how can we possibly feed that many people? Or uh, I'm not, let me take a stab, and Andy, uh, you'll correct me if I mess up. Uh, all I can tell you is the initial research analysis suggests that you have uh, enough land and capacity to add housing beyond the 10 year forecast that we've prepared. So uh, I am not that smart. I, I, I can tell you that I charge very little for a hundred year forecast. I won't be around to see the results and I know I'm gonna be wrong. I charge more for a 10 year forecast where over the last 52 years, the firms had a pretty good track record, you know, a batting average of, you know, the equivalent of 300 in uh, baseball. So the short answer is I, I, I would focus on uh, encouraging the, uh, the land use policies and the housing policies that will create uh, a diverse stock of housing for the next 10 years that will provide economic and social benefits to the community and uh, yes, in the long run, uh, water is always a challenge. I'm actually in Arizona today, and one of our client communities just, I read in the paper, is spending $80 million to buy water rights. Colorado and Arizona are part of the states that have to deal with the Colorado River Compact. So there's always going to be um, uh, physical constraints, regulatory constraints, natural constraints, but what we're trying to focus on are the things that we know something about, which is the underlying demographic and social and economic factors that are driving the needs for housing over the next 10 years. And the good news is uh, you at least have enough without having to do, be too worried about uh, these long-term matters over the next 10 years. And so I, it doesn't really answer your question other than to say there's good news. You have you have enough capacity to, to meet the the challenges in the in uh, the short run, and that's what we're going to focus on over the next ten years. And we'll try to give some guidance on what to look forward to after that. But uh, your guess is good as mine over the next hundred. And uh, did any other quick ads or changes? <laughs> Where in Arizona are you? I'm in Scottsdale. Yeah, uh, yeah. I spend time in the Phoenix area, so I keep hearing about the water they're buying. Yeah, it's uh, and uh, and uh, we've served the city of Scottsdale since 1980, and uh, there's been 
uh, all sorts of changes in the housing and the economic base and water is always an issue and and uh, where the housing is built and what type of housing is always an issue. But in general, uh, if, if you look in the long, long run, many, many, many communities over time have become more prosperous, more successful, when uh, and done much better than they were forecast to do or expected to do when they started. And I, I'm generally very optimistic that uh, when there's political will and a good business plan, there's a way to overcome what seems like very uh, challenging problems like water, uh, which you were talking about this morning. But uh, generally we've gotten nicer housing, better housing, better quality of life, and all you have to do is go look at a, a castle or a king's uh, uh, home 100 years ago and look at your home today. And most times you have a nicer home than they did. You have plumbing, for example. So I'm optimistic that uh, these long term challenges can be met. Yeah, right. I don't have anything to add specifically other than to maybe address what I thought was part of your question, which is kind of alluding to you know, what's kind of the build out capacity of Lakewood. And then once it's built out, what happens way, way in the future. And we're not estimating the water capacity or anything of that nature. I mean, we've, we've got information from city staff that documents how many units have been either proposed or planned or titled or denied. So we know there's many thousands of housing units that could be built. Um, whether or not there's water to serve them 100 years from now, we don't know. I would tell you that we've done some similar work for communities that are more rural in Colorado that have 300 year water supply rules as opposed to 100 year rules that the state requires. And there's a trade off, you know, you can preserve more water from aquifers, but housing is going to be more expensive. Or you can, in some ways, do what you're discussing in the previous presentation, you know, encourage people to conserve water and all else being equal, housing should be a little less expensive because that is part of the capital cost of building housing, which is providing water to a housing unit. So okay, I, I think I'm not going to worry too much more about 10 years, but I'll let my younger colleagues worry about the 25 year plan. So girls, it's on you looking around. Mm. All right, uh, Ms. Vincent and Ms. Mayak Carrero. Yes, thank you. Um, I had handed, handed in some questions earlier this morning, um, and I was hoping some of the answers would be back by now, but I'll I'll go over them just uh, so that council knows that I've submitted them, if that's okay. One is, is that um, I did not see, you may be able to answer this right now, um, within the data, I did not see the bedroom bathroom count for the apartments that you were comparing? Yeah, we didn't, that we did uh, write answers. And if you didn't get them, we can read you the answers we wrote within a few moments of getting your questions. The only one we didn't answer was that one, because frankly, there's nothing in the report about the topic and I don't know what you're talking about. So maybe you can tell me what you're trying to ask. Yeah, ask what I mean, yeah. okay. You have apartment um, rents. You have apartment rents. That's for what? A two bedroom, two bath, a three bedroom, a one bedroom. That can make a difference in in rent rents. Okay. So, uh, Anne, did you want to take that? We do have that. We, okay. did, we didn't. We didn't describe bathrooms. We do have it by size. Um, yeah, there's some information about how rents differ between one, two, three bedroom or studio apartment. Yeah. It's yeah, um, me... oh, okay. <laughs> so what was the data that we were looking at? I, I'm not trying to make this difficult. I just, people had those questions. So you're talking about a two bedroom apartment or a one bedroom apartment when you're looking at $1,275 or whatever. You can give me the answer later because I'm sure there's other people in other wards who will probably have that question. Yeah, we can. And that, what you see it is 
a draft technical report. So if you have questions that are technical in nature, we can try and address them. But, but the, you know, the other finals. ones, it's actually in the report and I'm having trouble with uh, having, uh, I'm like old school and this technology is beyond <laughs> me. I'm trying to pull up the report, which I had but I can't uh, getting the second one, not the first, but it's in there, but we'll we'll answer it. But the other two, if you want, we can uh, read you the answers if you'd like. Your two other questions we, we did answer. Uh, would you like those? Um, or do you want yeah, us just to so write, or should we just write the answers with the, and post them on the website with the rest of the answers? I am I am fine with that. So you have the numbers that were gathered with the gaps that were in Archway and lower income and what's currently in process. Um, Maybe we, Miss Vincent, can you? I mean, uh, help me understand. Yeah. I, Do you mean what has been built affordable? And they, I'll read you the question that I submitted. Okay. I'm I'm feeling like I tried to submit these early. I haven't gotten any information back back on them. The it was although it was stated gaps in the projects for apartments and affordable housing such as Archway, I did not notice any information about what was currently in the works. Information about the numbers that are in process that are and the process that are directly related to current zoning, which is not impacted by 1427. So it's the things that are getting built now. We have it appears to have a lot of apartments and housing coming in. And that I did it, not know if it's included or not. Yeah, as city staff developed a list of site planning and pre-planning applications for residential projects. As of October 2022, there were approximately 3,900 housing units included in the pre-planning applications received over the prior 12 months. Additionally, there are approximately 4,300 housing units associated with site planning cases that were initiated in the prior three years. These two sources of potential, quote, future housing construction in Lakewood represent about 8,200 housing units. We have not tried to quantify how many of these units or which of the planned proposed developments would be impacted uh, by any uh, regulations or, you know, we're not, we're not going to the detail of reviewing each project uh, to figure out uh, um, which ones are going to be approved and which ones are going to be built. All we know is there's a lot of units that are proposed of a variety of types, including uh, apartments. And then I think you asked about the count of condo and apartment dwelling units taking place. And table three, page 12 of the existing conditions report does have the number of new construction permits issued through September 22. And then there were two previous pieces uh, on the housing stock on pages seven and eight. They were drawn from the 2020 census or the 21 American Community Housing Survey. So more recent estimates are not available uh, for, for the count of uh, dwelling units for uh, uh, since the uh, 2021 community center. Again, we'll try to write all these up, but th this is, we have 50 pages of details, and apparently uh, we need to add another 10, which we're happy to do. But uh, we didn't try to go over all of these uh, tonight because we would be here to, to midnight, and I suspect some of you have other things you want to do. But I hope the short answer, I hope that's the short answer, but we'll, I'm sorry you didn't get it. Uh, yeah. I have a feeling that uh, there may be some technical difficulties, but we did, we did answer them literally when they came in. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a side note, if we could address the the comments on Lakewood Speaks in in written format too, would be helpful. We'll do um, that. Thank you, Miss Maya Guerrero. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. I think that this study is a great foundation, which I'm sure I'll circle back to. Um, I wanted to just, I, to me, I'm really seeing within this study a really a clear need for both an increase of affordable units for rent, which is 
Uh, when I say affordable, like I talk about often in this space, I don't mean specifically subsidized, although that also, but in addition, I mean middle income, working families like can afford it. Um, I also see really a need for us to think about the pathway to homeownership. And those feel like really big gaps that this uh, demonstrates incredibly clearly. And I also, I just wanted to make sure that for those, um, you know, following along at home that they know that, uh, of course, water and food and land are things that we definitely have to worry about. But um, of course, when we have more density, we actually have smaller water impact per person and per household. And that more density also tends to lead to a smaller carbon fo footprint per person and per household, although, of course, it's a larger carbon footprint per lot. And so just to um, address some of Councillor Olver's concerns um, that the the what might be the limiting factor of why we stop building, I think should really be based on the needs of humans that are living here in Lakewood, um, socio and economic, uh, rather than thinking about those as much. Although of course we wanna have reasonable sustainability practices. I hope that we are focused on creating an affordable, accessible and sustainable community. And I actually think that density can really help with that. Um, I also, um, I also just wanted to make sure that we're uplifting to the the really great work that was done on some of the the neighborhood level um, data within this study, and I hope that that also helps us. I think, um, you know, Councillor Vincent didn't bring it up this time, but I know she and I both talk a lot about the rate of affordable housing and new builds that are in our ward, and so really thinking about how we're ensuring that there is a level of affordability and uh, both for renting and for ownership across the city. And I don't really have a question. I just wanted to make sure that sort of that, that read of, of those things is out there for folks. And lastly, again, to just really commend such a thorough study and hoping that this is the foundation for forward thinking, for innovation, and for thinking about how to make the best possible community. Thank you, and, and this is just getting started. We have a, an extensive community survey. We're looking at the economics of developing housing and uh, then developing a plan and talking with you about it. So this is just the uh, early innings of the ball game, but thanks for your comments and uh, you read it the way uh, we would have intended it to be read. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna go to public input portion of this if anybody wishes to weigh in on this presentation and again this is on lakewood speaks and lakewood together um and people will have a great opportunity to weigh in as we go forward okay not seeing any want to again thank our folks for coming out and giving us the preliminary and we look forward to working with you through this and certainly you'll probably have a lot of information coming in and a lot of great questions from council, so thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Great. Okay, so we do, as a study session, we have um, committee updates. If anybody has a committee update, I just, I just want to circle back to one thing. Um, I think it's important for us as we all try to work together to acknowledge one another in respectful ways. And, and while somebody might not think calling somebody girls is offensive, these are women and colleagues and, and fellow council members. And I wanna make sure that they're respected with that same level. They're not girls, um, they're your colleagues, they're council members and they're adult women. So please, as we move forward, keep that in mind. Okay, committee reports. as sure as I. Yeah, thank you. A uh, couple of things. Selection committee is aiming for a March 8th um, interview process. We have more than a dozen openings across our board and commission. So just a, a personal um, request to all of my colleagues here on council to please help spread the word of these opportunities. Um, we'd love to see some, it's, you know, 
one of the better parts of this job is seeing all these dedicated community members show up um, to dedicate time and volunteer to support our community. Um, and then I wanted to give just some Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog updates. We've been meeting. Um, the January meeting was really focused on setting the legislative principles for um, what's going to come up in this legislative session. So I should have more updates on that after the February meeting. And then we had a work session on Wednesday of last week um, where we started continuing the conversation around affordable housing and polling members of the council around questions such as what's out of reach for your local government to accomplish a loan that you want to see addressed by like a regional housing strategy. So I'll continue to update folks. There's a lot of discussion about affordable housing. It'll be interesting to see a regional approach to finding some solutions to support this. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you. Ms. Vincent. Hi, thank you. Usually you let us talk about if we're going to have office hours this Wednesday from 10 to 12, our ward meetings. <laughs> Would you like to talk okay about if you're going to have office hours? Um, yes. uh, I guess if you want to have an upcoming council meeting, please. Yeah. So I will have office hours this Wednesday from 10 to 12 at, at City Hall. Everyone's welcome. Thank you. And it'll be an open forum. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Strom. Thank you. Uh, just a quick update on Head Start. We've already had um, one meeting this year, and we will actually be getting a full report as a full council body um, coming up later this month. Um, separately, I chair the budget and audit board, and no meetings yet this year, but we did talk when we met last time in November. We did talk about um, potentially meeting towards the latter end of Q1, beginning of um, second quarter and or beginning of the second quarter to um, pick up on the work and the conversation that we had in the latter part of the year. So stay tuned. I should have more information about that soon. Great. Thank you. Ms. Stewart. Thank you. I just wanted to give an update to the community and the rest of council that the legislative uh, committee has met and we have chosen to support Senate Bill 97 um, to take a support position, which is different than a strong support position. And we might be revisiting that. But for now, we are taking a support position on Senate Bill 97, which is the motor vehicle theft bill that has been introduced to um, make sure that we are, um, you know, looking at penalties across the board in a more equal way and really looking at the victims of motor vehicle theft and less about the value of the car um, to determine what type of penalties there are. So um, that has not passed yet, but um, we are we are monitoring that and supporting it at this point in time um, as we think it's something that um, the community has been asking for. And so just wanted to say we're listening, we're supporting. Thank you. Mr. Olver, you have a committee update? Nope. I, I think it's not up to you to decide what other people might find offensive. I think it's up to them. Oh. Cool. I find it offensive to be called a girl. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not muting you, Mr. Olver. So then, who? Oh, right. My hands up. You're right. My bad. Um. Well, uh, the only thing I can say there is, when you get to be my age, you might appreciate it a little more. Um, well, and I obviously don't mean, I actually look at people as girls and boys, all of us. And and quite simply, you, you might don't take it as an insult because my, you, as you know, my style is very familiar and it obviously isn't meant as an insult. Um, so, but I'm, I'm not gonna apologize about it because that's just the way things are. I'm always going to go into more of a familiar style, a more uh, friendly style, and not so much as a formality as you guys might want. And and 11 of us, 12 of us here on, in pictures, 
we all have different opinions on what this is. So I don't think it's up to the mayor to decide what um, what to, no. to speak up for other people. They can speak up for themselves. Everybody here has got a sufficient ego. And if somebody is insulted, as uh, Councilor Mayo Guerrero has just said, they can speak up for themselves. So thank you. And I um, don't, I, I set, I run the meetings and we're going to set a tone and we're going to have respect. And the respect being that we have several women on this council and you're not going to refer to them as girls, um, just out of decorum for the body. So uh, you can do what you wish in your own time, but I do feel like some were offended and it's my job to try to run the meeting and make sure everybody feels welcomed and supported. Okay. I would say that some are the opposite of offended. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Olbrey. I think you've given yourself enough for this evening. So thank you. All right. With um, anything else left here, uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn this at 8.45 p.m. Thank you.